So Mariah goes to church, and um, she gives her life to Jesus. So the pastor baptizes her in water and says, Marai, from now on, you're not going to be called Marai. You're going to be called Maria. So you need to tell yourself you are Maria because you are changed, and you're going to tell your friends that you are Maria. So she's like, awesome. Thank you, Pastor. I guess not Marai, I guess Maria. And so she goes home, and she gets comfortable, and then she gets up, goes to the liquor cabinet, takes out a bottle of wine, and she says to the bottle of wine, you are no longer wine, you are Oros. So we've been talking about activating your faith, okay? We've been talking about living out of your heart. We have a message of the heart of the matter where everything that we do, we do because of what is happening in our hearts, that we attract in life what we believe in our hearts, both for good and for not good, which means that I can no longer play uh, play the blame game. I can no longer blame other people for what I'm experiencing in life, but I can take ownership and not be a victim, but be a victor and apply the truth of God's word and his love to my heart that I can write new beliefs on my heart so that I can experience something different. In uh, Galatians chapter 5, it says, for we are in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision counts for anything, but only faith activated, energized and expressed and working through love. So for my love to be expressed, for my love or my faith to be expressed and energized and working for me, it's when my faith is connected to the love that God has for me. When I know that God loves me, when I know that God's intent, God's, the reason why God does what He does is because He is motivated by love for me. That everything that God has done in His Son, Jesus, is for me and it's because He loves me. And when I get to know that God's character and the intent and his motive toward me is love, my faith is energized and activated and begins to work for me. So last week we looked at some of the points from Sarah, um, how when God dealt with her, she, be, she made the decision in her heart to believe that God is faithful, that God is faithful, that she considered him faithful. She gathered evidence concerning the prov- promise. So she began to take what God said concerning the promise and activated her heart by gathering the evidence that God had said, look at the stars, look at the grains of the the, the seashore, look around you and see, man, gather evidence concerning my intent and character. That faith is not a formula, it's not something that I begin to do and if I do this then God will do that. No, faith is a response to what God has done. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen, things in the Greek, there's talking about things that have already been accomplished. So my faith is connected to the love of God and to what has already been accomplished. And that that is how I walk. I walk in faith, trusting God that He is faithful, that His word toward me is true. So how come there are times in my life when I feel that things are not working? There's times when I, I'm walking these things out and it's, I'm not getting the desired Result. So there are things that can sabotage my faith, which cause me much pain. And one of the things that will keep me hindered, where I will keep repeating things over and over again and not experience freedom, something that continually causes pain in my life and in the pain and pain in, in the lives of others, something that keeps me hindered from experiencing the very life of God. You not want to know what it is? Only one or two of you. The thing that will keep you hindered, the thing that will keep you to experience pain over and over and over again is judgment. Judgment. In Luke 6, verses 37 to 38 in the New Living Translation, it says, Do not judge others. And you will not be judged. Do not condemn others or it will all come back against you. Forgive others and you will be forgiven. Give and you will receive. Your gift will return to you in full. Press down, shaken together to make room for more. Running over and poured into your lap. The amount you give will determine the amount you get back. 
See, many people, when they go to church, especially when I was a younger Christian, they would take the Scripture and they would use it for money. And they would say, give and it will be given to you. Good measure, pressed down, running over, shall all men give unto your bosom. But the whole context in Luke chapter 6 is not talking about money. It's talking about mercy. It's talking about love. It's talking about forgiveness. It's talking about don't judge, don't condemn others. Because what you give to others, you are going to get back. And that's what he says there in Luke 6, in the original translation, it says, shall all men give unto you. So he's saying here, listen, if you give judgment, if you make and pass judgment about people, and the reason why you think people are doing what they are doing, and you exalt yourself to being God, because you have determined why somebody is doing what they are doing, as you use that to judge and measure people, guess what's going to happen? The very same judgment you use concerning people is what all men are going to give back unto you, running over good, pressed down, running over, are you going to get back? See, the reason why God says, do not judge, is because when I judge, I have formed an opinion as to the reason why somebody has done something to me. And then, because I've assumed the reason why and determined the motive and intent behind why somebody has done something, and I then equate that emotion and write a belief on my heart, my whole view of life becomes distorted. And I begin to view things based on my opinion and how I see it. Listen, how you see it is not as it is. How you see it is just how you see it. How you see it is based on your view. But how it is or how you see it might not be how it is. And the moment you make a judgment and, and determine the reason, you've elevated yourself to being God. And that's why God says, listen, leave judgment to me. You stay away from judgment. Stop determining and, and deciding why people do what they do. Let me explain something. If you make a judgment about why somebody has done something and say, I would never do that, you're headed for disaster. Because anybody in the right emotional state, in the right circumstances, is capable of doing anything. So never ever elevate yourself in pride by saying, I will never do that. Because you are capable of doing anything in, under the right emotional state in the right circumstances. You know, many people in prison are in prison because of one rash decision made in an environment where their emotions were heightened and things escalated and got out of control and it's one thing. And you can go ask their mothers. What do you mean, Steve? Well, you go and ask their mother. Oh, no, he's such a kind, loving person. Never even thought that he would do that. You're capable, I'm capable of doing anything under the right circumstances. And that's why God says, don't judge. Stop judging. Stop elevating yourself above another human being by saying, I would never. And determine the reason why people are doing what they're doing. You don't know why people are doing what they're doing. Sometimes you don't even know why you do what you do. Yet you want to assume why other people are doing what they're doing. Yet you don't even know why you do what you do. Have you ever had that when you've met somebody and they come to you after you've been friends with them for a couple of months and they say, man, you're not like what I thought you were. You're actually got a nice guy. I thought... <laughs> I thought you were, well, 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 and then they tell you how nice you are. And it's like, well, Flip, I didn't need that kind of information, but thanks, thanks anyway. Why? Because we have made a judgment about somebody before knowing them. So what are things that distort our views? The pain and disappointment of the past. So we experience pain, we experience disappointment, we make a judgment as to why it happened, we write a belief on our hearts, and we have distorted view. Bitterness. We equate bitterness 
and we don't deal with bitterness, if you don't deal with the pain and the disappointment and the problems of the past, they're going to follow you for the rest of your life. The way we grew up. So, for example, a lady or a girl is told from a young age, sex is dirty. Grows up with this some, something written on their heart and they can never ever experience intimacy with a relationship with a husband because it's been imprinted on her heart, sex is dirty. So that has distorted that person's view. Our mistakes from the past distort us. The way we were spoken to or related to as children forms beliefs in our heart and we begin to view life from that perspective. We all look at things based on our own perspective. So I'm going to say it again. The way I see it is not how it is. The way I see it is just the way I see it. But it might, might not be based on truth. So have you ever seen that in your own heart? If you assume someone as being arrogant, then that's what you see. Because you see what you're looking for. You will see in others what you have made a judgment about. So if you believe in your heart they don't care, then guess what you're going to see? Oh, you see, they don't care. And you'll find a reason and look for something and deter because you've determined they don't care. If you think people don't like you, you make that judgment, you're going to meet people who don't like you. Listen, it's so important that you do not make judgments when I say, you can make an observation as to why people do what they do. You can make an observation to say, oh, that's what they did. But don't elevate yourself to being God and determine the reason why they've done that. The big difference between an observation and a judgment. Hello? So how do I experience freedom from judgment? How do you experience freedom from judgment? How can you live in an environment where you are not coming up with opinions about people and assuming the reasons why. Well, the first thing is you have to learn to receive mercy. Hurting people hurt people. The reason why we hurt people is because we are hurting. And the reason why we are hurting is because we have never learned how to receive the mercy of God. We have never opened our hearts up to the place where we are allowing God to be merciful to us. In Psalm 136, the psalm is 26 verses long. And after every verse, David says, The Lord's loving kindness and mercy endures forever. This is after a man had committed adultery, had committed murder, and had proclaimed the death sentence over his own life. Remember the story? The prophet comes to David and says, David, there was a young family who adopted a little lamb. And they grew this lamb up as to be their own, as to have as their own pet. And another man came and took that lamb and slaughtered it. And David made a decree from the king. And when a king made a decree, then it became law. And he said, that man needs to die. And the prophet said, you're the man. He was under triple death sentence, David. A death sentence for adultery, a death sentence for murder, and a death sentence because he had made a king's decree that the man needs to die. And what did David do? He ran into the mercy of God. He went and ran into the presence of God. And he said, God, be merciful to me. Cleanse me. Forgive me. And he received mercy and forgiveness. And the Bible says that he was a man of the God's own heart because he knew what was in God's heart. That God's heart is filled with mercy. The word mercy is God's willingness, His intent, His desire from His bowels, from the deepest place of who He is, to be kind and compassionate toward you. And David ran into the mercy of God. The Bible says that Jesus is a faithful and merciful high priest. 
God desires for you to experience His mercy. When you're coming to Him, not based on your own merit, not based on the pains and the disappointments of the past, of the things and the mistakes that you have made, but you're running into the arms of God because you see Him as the one who is merciful to, toward you, who is treating you better than you deserve. All of us are guilty and deserving of death, yet God in His Son, Jesus Christ, punished him and made him go to hell and experience a tormentous death so that you and I could experience his mercy. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. For his mercy and loving kindness endure forever. Oh, give thanks to the God of gods for His mercy and loving kindness endure forever. Oh, give thanks to the Lord of lords for His mercy and loving kindness endure forever. To Him alone who does great wonders for His mercy and loving kindness endure forever. To Him who earnestly remembered us in our low estate and imprinted us on His heart for His mercy and loving kindness endure forever. And rescued us from our enemies for his mercy and loving kindness endure forever. To him who gives food to all flesh for his mercy and loving kindness endure forever. Oh, give thanks to the God of heaven for his mercy and loving kindness endure forever. I think David was trying to make a point. In the New Living Translation, it says, His faithful love endures forever. And I've said this before, man. Endure means the ability to take prolonged strain or pressure. Some of your chairs are enduring right now. <laughs> but God's love endures forever. It has the ability to take prolonged strain and pressure. It doesn't matter how much strain or pressure you put upon His mercy. It has the ability to take prolonged strain and pressure. His mercy never ends. Forever means forever. Forever means eternity. His mercy is never ever going to run out on you. No matter how much strain you put on it. No matter how much pressure you put on His mercy, on His love, it will endure forever. And we, as His children, need to learn how to receive mercy. Instead of coming to God with our disappointments and pains and trying to fix ourselves, trying to earn enough brownie points where we can get some blessing from God, we should be running into His arms the Bible says entering into his throne room with boldness, a throne room of grace that we might obtain help and mercy in our time of need. David did this. His, your time of need is when you have made a mistake. That's when you have a need of God. And that's what David did. He ran into the presence of God and he said, Lord, I am a guilty man, but I thank you that I know what's in your heart. That you are filled with mercy and your mercy endures forever. Your failures will never ever stop or nullify God's unfailing love for you. There is nothing you can do to stop God from being merciful to you. Jesus said this. The Pharisees got so upset with him because he was hanging out with tax collectors and sins and he was being kind and merciful to, who, to those who he thought were not deserving of mercy. And they got upset. And you can read it in Matthew 9, Matthew 12. In Matthew 9 it says there, Jesus said to them, go and learn what this means. I desire mercy and not sacrifice. And then in Matthew chapter 12, they're complaining because the disciples are eating grain on the Sabbath. And then he says to him, listen, you have not learned if you had learned what it means that I desire mercy, not sacrifice, you would understand who God is. But you haven't learned it. You think it's about you. And it's actually about God who loves you. In Ephesians 1, in the Message Bible, it says, Long before he laid down earth's foundations, he had us in mind had settled on us as the focus of his love, to be made whole and holy by his love. How are you made whole? How do you become holy and separated unto God? It's by his love for you. 
Long, long ago, he decided to adopt us into his family through Jesus Christ. What pleasure he took in planning this. God delights in you. He wanted us to enter into the celebration of his lavish gift giving by the hand of his beloved son. Because of the sacrifice of the Messiah, his blood poured out on the altar of the cross. We're a free people. Free of penalties and punishments chalked up by all our misdeeds. Hallelujah. And not just barely free, either abundantly free. He thought of everything, provided for everything we could possibly need. The second thing, we need to learn to be at peace with ourselves. We need to learn to be at peace with ourselves. You need to learn how to be at peace with you. You are never going to be perfect. Hello? And some of you are striving to be perfect. You are perfect in God's eyes because of what Jesus has done. So stop trying to be perfect for people. You're never ever going to be perfect. Why? Because people have made judgments about you. One of the biggest battles we face in life is coming to the place where we are at peace with who we are. You know, it's okay to love what God loves, and God loves you. It's okay for you to love you. What are the two greatest commandments? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, your mind, your soul, and your strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. But I can't love my neighbor until I love myself. And I can't love myself until I know I'm loved by God. Because we love him because he loved us first. You need to be at peace with being you. Warts and all. With your nose hairs and wobbly bits. You know, when you're not at peace with yourself, then you don't like yourself. And you need to like yourself as well as, as well as love yourself because God made you. You need to value what God values. And God has determined your value. He determined your value by the price that he paid for you. So I need to know that God is at peace with me because of Jesus and that he has valued me and I need to value what he values. I need to love what he loves. See, if, if, if I'm not at peace with me, I'm going to look to people to make me happy. I'm going to look for circumstances to make me happy. I'm going to look for a bank account to make me happy. I'm going to look for addiction to make me happy. But when I start to believe the truth of what Jesus did in his son, that God is at peace with me and I accept me for me, with my mistakes and issues and insecurities, and it's like, man, that's who I am. I'm, I'm based up, I'm based with up of a whole bunch of life experiences and judgments that even I make about myself, which are incorrect, and that God loves me irrespective of that. And it's as I begin to meditate and think about His mercy and His love toward me that I start to become whole, because I start to accept me for who I am. So how do I come to being at peace with me? It's, you've got to see what Jesus did in 2 Corinthians 5, 18. To 21, and all things are of God who has reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ and has given to us the ministry of reconciliation, that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not imputing their trespasses to them. The word impute here is an old word which means to have an account. Where, when you go to the bar, you have an account there. Some of you don't go to the bar. Okay, so when you, when you go to the club, We'll make it religious. And you have an account there. And then you settle your account when you leave. It's saying that God does not take an account of your sins. He's not racking up your sins against you. He's not holding them against you, waiting for you to pay for them one day. Jesus already paid for them. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ, as a God that does beseech you by us, we pray you in Christ's stead be re reconciled to God. For he has made him who knew 
to be sin for us who knew no sin that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. I like the way it says in the Message Bible. It says, all this comes from God who settled the relationship between us and him and then called us to settle our relationships with each other. God put the world square with himself through the Messiah, giving the world a fresh start by offering forgiveness of sins. And God has given us the task of telling everyone what he's doing. We are Christ's representatives. God uses us to persuade men and women to drop their differences and enter into God's work of making things right between them. We're speaking for Christ himself now. Become friends with God. He's already a friend with you. In Colossians 1.20, And having made peace through the blood of the, his cross by him to reconcile all things to himself, God is at peace with you. That is why it is called the gospel of peace. That is why in Isaiah 54 it says, This gospel of peace, the covenant of peace, shall never be removed. Never. Colossians 3.15, let the peace of God rule in your hearts to, to hearts to which also you were called. You have to be at peace with being you. You need to accept yourself because God accepts you. Which leads me to my last point. Once you've received mercy, once you believe God is at peace with you, this is when we begin to extend mercy. We learn how to give what we receive. Jesus said, freely you have received, freely give. As you've received mercy, begin to live it out by extending mercy to others. You remember the prodigal son, the older brother, when he hears that his son has come home, makes a judgment about his younger brother. Remember the beginning of the story? God divided the inheritance between his two sons. And here the older son says, Lord, or, or master, or father, I've been working in your fields and haven't transgressed any command. Oh, really? No command? And yet you haven't given me a skinny goat. Working for what was already given to him. Never experiencing intimacy and relationship with his father. Because what did the father say? Son, all that I have is yours. See, when I live in judgment toward others, my heart is not open to receiving what God has already given. In Matthew 7, don't pick on people, jump on their failures, criticize their faults, unless, of course, you want the same treatment. That critical spirit is a way of boomeranging. It's easy to see a smudge on your neighbor's face and be oblivious to the ugly sneer on your own? Do you have the nerve to say, let me wash your face for you, when your own face is distorted by contempt? It's this whole traveling roadshow mentality all over again, playing a holier-than-thou part, instead of just living your part. Wipe that ugly sneer off your own face, and you might be fit to offer a washcloth to your neighbor. In Romans 14, I'll close with this portion. You can read the whole chapter in Romans chapter 14, but some of the scriptures say this. So where does that leave you when you criticize a brother? And where does that leave you when you condescend to a sister? I'd say it leaves you looking pretty silly or worse. Eventually, we're all going to end up kneeling side by side in the place of judgment facing God. Your critical and condescending ways aren't going to improve your position there one bit. Read it for yourself in Scripture. As I live and breathe, God says, every knee will bow before me. Every tongue will tell the honest truth that I and only I am God. So tend to your knitting. He's saying, listen, forget about everyone else. Focus on you and God. Don't worry about anybody else, what they're doing and why they're doing it. Focus on what's happening in your heart. You've got your hands full just taking care of your own life before God. Forget about deciding what's right for each other. Here's what you need to be concerned about, that you don't get in the way of someone else, making life more difficult than it already is. I'm convinced, Jesus convinced me, that everything as it is in itself is holy. We, of course, by the way we treat it or talk about it, can contaminate it. 
in verse 19. So let's agree to use all our energy in getting along with each other. Help others with encouraging words. Don't drag them down by finding fault. Focus on receiving God's mercy. Focus on the fact that God is at peace with you. And as you begin to believe and receive mercy and love for yourself, you start to experience wholeness in your heart. We are no longer trying to get revenge. You know, when people hurt you, when people cause pain and disappointment in your life, our natural tendency is an eye for an eye. You've hurt me, I'm going to hurt you back. God's way is, if you've experienced pain and disappointment, and we all have, everyone has experienced that from people. If I don't deal with it, it's going to come back and repeat itself. I'm going to just get more of it. Why? Because I've made judgments and I get what I give. That's why God says, don't judge. Let go of judgment, but rather extend mercy, rather forgive, rather don't condemn, but rather extend kindness because what you give is what you're going to get back to you. So if somebody is hurting you, if someone is causing pain, if somebody is is abusing you as a person, the way that you can get wholeness is by coming and running into the arms of God and saying, Lord, thank you that you're going to be merciful to me. That as I've experienced pain and hurt and disappointment in the past, maybe I've made bad mistakes or other people have hurt me through choosing. It's that place where I come and I experience redemption in God because I'm not looking to people to fix it but I'm looking to his mercy. It's his willingness and passion and desire to treat me better than I deserve. So in closing, receive mercy. Receive mercy. Be at peace with being you and begin to live it out by extending mercy to others. Don't you stand to your feet. If you don't deal with the disappointments of the past and you keep reliving those events, you're just going to get more of the same. The words to forgive means to divorce. It means to send away or to separate from. In the Hebrew, when it says, I am the Lord who heals you, Jehovah Rapha, it comes from the root Rapha, which means to relax. For you to receive healing, it means you need to relax in God instead of trying to get even. When you relax in Him, you get healed because you're not trying to fix things or get revenge or trying to punish people for what they've done to you, but you're resting in Him. You're resting in His mercy and His love for you. So I'm going to ask you if you wouldn't mind closing your eyes. I love to do this after every service because this is where you can activate what you've heard. If you're standing here this morning and you've experienced pain and disappointment and hurt from people, you can separate yourself from it right now where that doesn't follow you. By sending away offense, sending away the pain and the disappointment of what has happened, you send it away and you begin to turn to God and you, be, you, you receive the mercy that He has for you, where God treats you better than you deserve. We begin to say, see and declare and make a decision in your heart, Lord, thank you that you redeem me. You love me. You accept me. You're at peace with me. I'm loved and accepted. Maybe the people didn't love and accept you. You are loved and accepted by God. And you can put as much strain on His mercy and His love and it will never fail you. So just in in your heart, send away that pain and that disappointment. Send it away. Let go of those things that you need to let go of. And receive His mercy. Maybe you're standing here this morning. You've never received Jesus. You've never experienced His love. 
for yourself. You've heard about it. You've heard others talk about it, but you've never experienced it. I believe God brought you here this morning that you could receive his love and mercy. If you've never received Jesus, I believe that this morning there is an opportunity for you to receive him and his life and his love and his wholeness. I'd love to pray for you. If you've never received Jesus, but you just sense God knocking on the door of your heart this morning. You say, today is the day when I receive eternal life. I would love to pray for you. And I do not want you to leave this place without receiving what God has for you. So if you're standing here, you say, Steve, I've never, ever received Jesus, but today I want to. Please pray for me. Why don't you just slip up your hand quickly so I can see who you are. And I'm going to lead you in a simple prayer to receive the life of God. Just slip up your hand quickly. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for responding to his goodness. Can we all pray together? You just say, Lord Jesus, I believe that you died for me and you rose again. You are Lord of all. I receive mercy. I receive your love. Thank you that I'm forgiven and saved by your work. In Jesus' name. Father, I pray for everyone else this morning. I pray for those who have been hurt. And I pray pray for those who have experienced pain and disappointment. For those who have sent that away this morning. I thank you for your mercy and your kindness and your love, which is more than enough, which endures forever, that it will become a revelation. That That your goodness will be revealed and experienced by everyone. In Jesus' name. If you would like-